Hello, 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 everybody. It is so good to see all of your digital non-existent faces in the chat. Welcome to Arc 7, Episode 2 of The Second Stranger. Oh my god. The thing that just happened with the URL group, I literally can't believe, and I'm about to put these suckers through the same kind of ringer in a completely different location. Hi, I'm Connie Chong. My pronouns are they, he, and she. I am your game master and creative producer. Find me all across the internet at by Connie Chong, B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G. Uh, you're tuning into The Second Stranger. This is the debut of the Chasm Group uh, for Arc 7. Transplanar RPG, if you don't know, The Second Stranger is an all-transgender POC-led D&D show set in an original dark fantasy, non-colonial, anti-Orientalist world. But without further ado, I'm going to pass along introductions up and over to Dare. Hi, I'm Dare. I've never done anything wrong in my life. My pronouns are she, they, and Faye. I'm playing Gentle, the lovely Triton monk whose pronouns are they, them. Uh, and I can be found on all parts of the internet at Dare to Dream RPG, D-A-R-E, the number two D-R-E-A-M RPG, where I just make things, do things, and I'm very hot while doing and making things. Uh, I'm going to throw it down to Val. Hi, everyone. I'm Valiant Mustachio Dad Dorian. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a Twitch variety streamer and a TTRPG performer. And today I have the distinct pleasure of playing Vasco, who uses she, they pronouns. The par- she is the Paragon Yabusa and the, our college at Sea Bard, who is jumping into a hole, I guess. Uh, you can find me on the internet at Valiant Dorian or at Otso Spirit Bear. I'm going to pass introductions over to Austin. Hey everybody, I'm Austin. Uh, my pronouns are he, they, she. My character's name playing is Abiku Ishtar, whose pronouns are she, they. You can find me on Twitter, that's the other part of this intro. Over on Twitter, at sales, could also, it's at sales, S-C-T, Austin. I do stuff, find me on Twitter. I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just so excited because for the first time ever, I'm gonna pass it up to C. <laughs> so excited hi everyone my name is Sia. use they them pronouns you can find me making very trans very gay art on the internet at pie sharp art i'm doing a lot of stuff check me out um today though i am playing our misbeloved paragon of sen okahyan oh my god it rhymes <gasps> i've never said it out loud before incredible uh and i am so excited to make that announcement i am also so excited to make this announcement which is that we are sponsored uh by demetrio pines and explain trade a negotiation skills training consultancy believe in the power of DD and transplanters potential to grow tell great stories and lift up our communities like babo lifts up his tail in front of connie's camera uh explain train trains negotiators for governments big companies ngos and offers e-learning courses for individuals looking to get a better deal from their boss you too like babo can rise up and overthrow your gm if you go to explaintrain.com and i will pass things over to austin for our patreon thanks Hey everybody, I'm doing the Patreon thanks now. Here we go. Uh, these are thank yous to our highest tier of Patreon patrons, our Patreon paragons, as it were. And the following are currently Patreon paragons. Azra, Bradley, Brooke Wright, Charles, Chuck Grace, Cora Eckhart, Emma, Hat, Canding, Lex Slater, Marvelous, Purple Mouse, Scruffasis, Alex and Target, thank you all so much for helping this all happen. You're all incredible. I'm going to now pass it over to Dare. Hi, for some reason, I keep being allowed to recap things. So, last time on The Second Stranger, Equilibrium reunites at Dr. Lusso's homestead on the night of Adolin, exactly one year after the cataclysm. Words are hard today. People from all across Sendaka have been uniting beneath the single star that shines directly over the homestead. The parties reunite, battered and changed, and after reading the tapestry from Moreau's, everyone learns that the past paragons left a spell for their future counterparts to help bring back the after. Everyone adds something special to the spell, and together they're all able to bring back the stars. Celebration ensues until a massive pillar of light explodes into the sky from the URL, and the earth begins to tremble from within the chasm. The stranger is almost here, and that's what you missed last time. Use exclamation point recap in the chat to read uh, to read our written recap doc. Uh, to get all the information about all the chaos that tends to happen every week here. And I'm going to pass it over to Valiant Story. Thanks, Dare. I am happy to let everyone know our title for today. Uh, today's title is Toward the End of Light from When I Am Alien by Justin Philip Reed. The full verse reads, Each vessel in this vessel thrusts toward the end of light. My young blood busies with agenda. I hunker in bodice, 
Through its orifice that manufactures from the dead, more life I was left this. Nothing but nothing is not a container. Have senses nothing in the center of every chamber, from star hearts to the stomachs of soldiers, tasted nothing on its breaths, and it breathes to live for nothing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that, Val. I'm sure that's not ominous at all. Uh, so content warnings for this particular episode and our campaign in general may include fantasy violence, body horror, gore, blood and bloodletting, apocalypse, trauma and grief, death of loved ones, familial struggles, complex and complicated relationships, romance and references to sexual entanglements, earthquakes, heights and falling, vast depths, and vast and unknowable bodies of water. Okay, uh, so you can always use exclamation point CW in chat for a full list of content warnings or exclamation point safety for a look at the cast's lines and veils to know what territory we'll never cross into uh, no matter how dark things get. So with that out of the way, let's begin. Chaos. Screaming. Panic. The ground shakes. A bone-deep rumble that topples war tents, collapses roofs, sends well-trained soldiers scattering to the four directions. Oka, Abiku, Voska, and Gentle. You hurtle toward the Euclid chasm, that black, jagged wound in the flesh of Andake. Rocks dislodge massive chunks of earth hurtling toward unknowable depths. As you fly, ride, and repel your way over the lip, you see flocks of bats, birds, flurries of panicked wings, claws, beaks erupting upward all around you. The chasm walls tessellate with rats. Lizards, mice, snakes, terrified animals and insects fleeing their home in every direction. The noise is cacophonous. Chittering, cawing, hissing, squeaking, howling. You see the larger animals now, the predators of the Euclid emerging from lairs tunneled deep within chasm walls. An owlbear rampaging out of a cave, a bulette erupting from the earth, rust monsters skittering up sheer cliffs like oversized beetles made of copper and claw, a herd of Kui, the Hoofbright clan, single-legged turquoise oxen hopping up narrow ledges alongside mountain goats, cougars, monkeys, vultures. You even see emissaries. Flocks of harpies taking flight, a manticore cutting through the air, winged serpents, scales, feathers, fur, horns, antlers, the creatures of Andake are abandoning the chasm, driven by instinct, adrenaline coursing, and all around you, you hear voices. Snatches of celestial, infernal, abyssal, primeridial, brimming out of the mouths of emissaries, beast tongues, from the lips of animals, the same phrases repeated across species, across different kinds of beasts and animals and emissaries and peoples. Run. 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 It's coming. It's waking. It's almost here. And yet, the four of you press onward, down past the chaos, past the screaming herds and swarms and flocks and crowds, the lone travelers, turning your faces toward the unknowable horror, like stones bracing against an overwhelming tidal wave. Let's start with you, Abiku. Tell me. How are you trying to get down the chasm, and how are you responding to this explosive exodus? Uh, uh Abiku is extremely worried and disturbed because, like, she she's like tapped into like 
natural uh, life in terms of like animals and creatures and whatnot. It was what I mean by that. Um, so seeing them all like dip, I think like everything in her body is like, and probably even Sun is like, we should turn around. Like, I feel like, because I'm on Sun, I feel like there's no way Sun's like, we should not go, like, I feel like it must be, like, steering, like, we should not be going this way. Mm. Um, but I think, confidently and assured, she urges Sun to go down, reminding them, like, we stopped one more, we can stop another one. Atop this winged obsidian drake's back, they actually kind of corkscrew, like turn around in the air instead of going down like you want them to. And you hear their voice in your head, even as they crack open their jaw and let out a kind of disturbed and worried, like hoofing and grunting and growling, like pebbles clacking against each other in the brim of their throat. Abiku, I, that's, I can feel it. Look at everyone else. All these other creatures, all these other beasts, the emissaries, that manticore up there. There's something down there that's not, that I don't know if we, I. We did not come back from 10,000 years of death to right now. We can do this, my friend. If you say so. And Sun corkscrews one last time through the air and starts to cut down into the chasm, past like the birds swarming past your face, past like the beetles skittering across the ground, even that manticore that's now like across the horizon and like hoofing it further south away from this place. And I think we're gonna pan over to Vasca. Vasca, how are you getting down and responding to this chaos? I think Vasca is heading down the chasm using Parable as a repel and is swinging it from stone to stone, from branch to branch, and on her way, before looping around the first branch, grabbed Costas by the waist and is swinging downwards. And I think seeing literally every other living thing leave the hole we are all hurling towards sets her into great unease and instead of allowing it to kind of like dominate her mind, she hangs on to the one thing that she knows she can influence and ensure their safety and clutches Costas closer to her as she repels and moves forward. Yeah, like a little princeling in distress. Costas clings to the front, I think, of your shirt, and it like their what is remaining of their hair on their non-frozen side is flapping around in the breeze. Their eyes are wide. They're letting out like a high-pitched scream, uh, but then that scream is cut through almost with like an adrenaline-filled howl as Costas is going. <laughs> oh, wow, Vasco! Wow, look at that! What the hell is that thing? What is that? A beulet? I've never seen a beulet with colors like that before. And look at those owl bears. <sighs> Fuck! So they can't fly! Isn't this amazing? <laughs> I think that is the moment where Vasca like, takes a note of everything, clutches them closer, and says, It is okay, Costas, I've got you. As, <laughs> as, as the <laughs> next rappel goes. Oh, gods! Oh, my gods! We're all gonna die, aren't we? We're all gonna die! <laughs> <laughs> Not if I have anything to say about it. And the next rappel goes. Vasca, you're so cool. And we're gonna pan over to Gentle. Wonderful. Um, uh, what Gentle does depends on, is, is Vasca nice enough to cast Featherfall? Absolutely. I am imagining that once we reach a, because she is repelling down and at some point she will run out of rock and, and tree to uh, repel from, she will cast Featherfall. Uh, beautiful, uh, because I think it is uh, still like riding bud, but we are just going vertically down, like hopping from rock to rock. It It, it is like Sonic running down a building. It is the best. Uh, <laughs> and I think it is very much just bounding uh, all the way down and just like making sure that bud is like, okay, because there's a lot of things that are bigger than bud are running the opposite direction. Um, and it is just a lot of like, hey, are are you good? Because like, 
we, we get to chomp some bad some bad guys i hope there is something really really bad down there gentle like really bad every single instinct in my body you know like the instincts of killing and eating and feeding that sybil taught me is telling me to run but we gotta go down there right yeah and hopefully we'll be able to chop something but also we'll be okay i promise i'll make sure you're okay <laughs> i trust you gentle trust you too and I give him like a little little pat on the on the rundown. And I think that's the first time Bud has said that to you since coming home from Dabathati, right? Like in this crucible of this excruciating exodus, terrified animals and emissaries fleeing in every direction, Bud seems to have reached some sort of conclusion with you, or rather, the end of a beginning and the beginning of a new one. And as we pan away from this dire wolf with fur rippling in the breeze, jumping from outcropping to outcropping to outcropping, we sweep up and see Oka. Oka has reached the lip of the chasm, and I think they're about to take like the first step off and like into into the hole, into the chasm. Uh, when I think it's like at the same moment that they're cresting over that an emissary or an animal something a flying fucking owl bear if that's what's happening also like punches up the lip of the chasm and i think sends them kind of whirling into the air for a moment um and they let go of uh dr Aluso's hand uh, and they kind of like spin out for a moment totally disoriented uh and the terror like starts to pick up in their chest um as they like just take take that blow real from it as like all of these creatures start to come up and this like frantic look comes into their face and into their eyes and and they look down see everyone going down and they do not want to lose sight of anyone and abiku is already starting to like get down into that mist and disappearing out of sight so oka looks down at dr luce and is like do you have a way to get down uh, Dr. Luso also stumbles at the lip of the chasm as the owlbear explodes upward. It's bigger than the two of you put together. It's massive. It's like the size of a dire grizzly bear uh, with these like huge feathered like arms and sharp claws and this owl like hooked beak face. But it's uninterested in the two of you. They're usually extremely territorial and aggressive, but even the predators here aren't hunting prey. It's kind of like the end of the world, right? Like dinosaurs off fleeing in the wake of a meteor crash. The priority here for everyone is to get the fuck out. So the owlbear just lets out a screech and a roar mixed together, hurdles over the two of you, hits the ground, causes a miniature earthquake of its own, and starts like, galloping off. Dr. Luso hurdles around, like their hair whipping in the breeze. Their like glasses slightly askew from like the terror and the chaos of everything. And they adjust to quickly back up their, the bridge of their nose and they go, Yes, I have a machine, Oka, and they're like striding over to you. I have a machine. The one I mentioned the night when we all first met. It um it's the same machine that printed out that graph. Ka Kaza machine, Kaza machine, Kaza machine. Just yes. take us there. Yes, okay. Uh, everyone, <clears throat> everyone. And this time their voice is magically amplified. Uh, and the three of you who are in the chasm already hear Dr. Luso's voice bouncing off of the rock. Everyone, please. I know we're all in a rush to get down there, but we need a plan first. Uh. Follow me. And Dr. Luso turns to look at you and says, I, uh, I, I quite enjoyed you holding me, but I can, I can get down myself. It was probably faster that way. Uh-huh. And there's like a gay moment when the two of you waste maybe like a second, just like standing at the lip looking at each other. And then like a, a fucking bulet explodes out of the ground next to you. And that like breaks the romantic tension, right? This massive like kind of like armored land shark just like tunnels its way out and starts scrabbling away. Uh, and Dr. Oluso turns around and hops off the lip of the chasm. And Oka takes three strides uh, backward and then three strides and then jumps out, free falls for a moment and then tucks all four of their wings against them and nosedives. You see Dr. Luso 
uh, they have created a hard light platform, uh, almost like a little dais for themselves. Uh, and they are like descending through the chasm, almost like a, like a tensor disc, uh, floating like between erupting gouts of bats and birds, like past the tremoring, shaking, vibrating walls all around you. And their disc is moving really fast, you know, and they're sort of like crouched down on it so they don't sort of fall off of it while it's happening. Uh, and they're keeping level with you as you nose dive down. And they're like pointing out, oh, careful, like outcroppings here, like a protruding root there, like a rampaging owlbear there, etc. And eventually I think all of you are grouped together. You have all like reached each other. We see a gentle atop a bud dashing from rock to rock. We see Vosco repelling down with Costas. We see Abiku atop sun cutting through the air alongside Oka and Dr. Eluso as well, just gravitating downward on top of that disc. And there's like a moment where it's all, your entire party together. You're just cutting downward as animals are crawling upward and flying and fleeing upward all around you. And Dr. Eluso sort of turns to make eye contact with each of you uh, in this line. And they say, all right, uh, we're gonna wanna bank left now. That tunnel over there, that's mine. And I think all of you just sort of bank left and you make your way onto like a kind of narrow landing in front of a wide tunnel. And Dr. Lucio, as soon as they step off that disc, they hop onto the landing, the disc evaporates in a gout of light and they are cutting it down that tunnel. And Bud also lands and starts running, you know, like Costas uh, gets off of you. Vasca just starts sprinting after Bud and Dr. Lucio, And the rest of you also pile into that tunnel and like start like just shutting down this corridor. You can hear your own footsteps vibrating off the walls of this hallway. Uh, your own voices, your heartbeats pumping in your ears, adrenaline coursing through your veins, red hot like magma. And eventually, this corridor terminates into a vast chamber. Uh, you see just like a huge kind of cylindrical space. It's really, really big in here. Uh, and it definitely looks like man-made. This isn't a natural formation. And dominating the center of this vertical chamber is a huge machine. It is dozens of feet tall. It's wider than a redwood. And it punches through the cylindrical heft of this chamber. It like extends upward through the ceiling and downward through the floor. Like you figure it's even larger than it is. This is just sort of an exposed part uh, of this device. It looks kind of like an auger, something you would use to cut through ice in Morose, uh, but it's just a lot bigger. And there are these sharp oscillating blades that wrap around like the steel central piston and drive all the way down toward the ground. And at the base of this device, you see a control panel. And there are various like buttons, knobs, wires, pumps, various glowing displays decorating every inch of this panel. Uh, and right now, it doesn't take a scientist to know something's going on. There's a concerning red light uh, flashing from a holographic readout that's sort of painting this entire chamber red. That's how bright and flaring this light is. And Dr. Eluso immediately is like running over to this panel. They start pulling levers. They start turning knobs. They start strobing their fingers over keys. And as they do all these things clacking away, sweat starting to trickle down one side of their face, they say, uh, thank you all so much for taking this really quick break. We need a plan. We need to be able to get down to whatever is causing this disturbance as quickly as possible, a spell. And they turn around and they sort of lean their hip against the panel, but their, their hands are still going. They're still doing stuff as they turn to address you. A spell like find the path or locate creature or anything like that doesn't work down here in the chasm. Believe me, I've tried. There's no real purely magical or physical way of just getting down there. But this machine, I built it myself um, over the course of a few years, I believe. Uh, and it, it should be able to pinpoint any sort of magical disturbance coming from deep within the chasm. If I can just uh, triangulate where the origin of all these shakes are coming from, I think I could essentially build us a map. I, okay, is it just me? I am very lost. You can make a map with the tubes? Yes, I can make a map with the tubes. Okay, thank you. That's, you should, next time the world is ending, you should start with that. Understood. Hopefully there won't be a next time, Abiku. This is just going to take a little bit, a few minutes at most, at most. Uh, one moment, and they sort of turn back and start like like banging on buttons and pulling levers and scribbling stuff down in a way that I don't think any of you are like scientists, so I don't think any of you can parse by just looking at. Sorry, dude's in the other party. <laughs> Absolutely not. Cannot be, cannot, Abiku cannot be burnt, bothered with science. Uh, I'll, uh... <laughs> 
I hate the El Papa squad somewhere, I guess. A baker sits! A baker sits! A baker sits! A baker sits. The apocalypse so is happening. Ibiku sits down. Uh, yeah, I I sit like in a, in a nondescript corner away from anything that looks like it's part of this machine because I don't get how it works. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to breathe on it. I don't. I don't get how it works. Sure, there are tubes and wires coming out from the base of the machine that disappear into the walls and also like knit into each other. So it's kind of hard. It's like stepping over various roots of trees that are jutting out of the earth a little bit, but they're all mechanical. Uh, but sun is huge now and they're like awkwardly, they fold their wings into their body and they're awkwardly okay. standing there, <laughs> like trying oh, not to. Yes, and I like, I like touch a scale and they like, like just dis- separate back into their pokeball i don't like into their happy space into the into their like mind palace <laughs> wherever they go when i unsummon them i assume it's like a pokeball and they're comfortable in napping a hundred percent Oka, this is the first time you've seen a biku just poof sun yep uh and i think Oka, after taking an owlbear to the face and then confronting uh their gay awakening kind of is standing there uh, with their like hands on their knees, panting a little bit, breathing kind of heavy um, from coming down. Uh, their wings are kind of just drooped out behind them, but as like Dr. Luce is kind of like, don't touch anything, they, they bring their wings in as well. Look at Abiku when sun disappears, because they didn't even process the fact that sun appeared because there were a ton of emissaries running around and monsters, and they just kind of go, that was, um, that was di- that was different. Oh yes, I forgot. Okay, so that is Sun. Sun. Sun woke up with me. We were both dead. Sun was skeleton. Now Sun. Sun has skin and is back how they used to be when we were alive. I think Sun. I don't know if Sun is alive or dead like me though. I have not checked. But they used to belong to my wife. They were my wife's uh, companion. Your what? Your your wife's companion? Yes. Um, I don't know how I ended up with Sun. Like why Sun woke up with me and she's not here. But they, when when she was alive, they were like bonded together. You know, with the whole draconic and the, the thing that V was talking about. I might have missed like a couple thousand years worth of updates about your your life. Um, oh. My bad. No, uh, it's totally fine. I, I mean, I just haven't heard from you. We haven't really sp- spoken at all. <laughs> but you do look different, so it sounds kind of like you did find what you were looking for. Yes. You no, know, I met you at that party and you made things awkward. And then... Oh, you sent me a letter, that's right. I, uh, I tend to make things awkward I I have a lot of feelings and it's kind of hard for me to um, let them out you know a lot of the soul shattered stuff we talked about that right we um, kind of that you don't dream and I didn't dream for a long time because our souls are kind of yes yes I do not know if I have one to steal that didn't. The Raven Queen did not answer me that. I didn't. I didn't think to ask you, right? You are different. And Abiku looks at Oka. <laughs> and I think when Oka blinks this time, uh, like a familiar, it's almost like Sun's eye looks back mm-hmm. at you for like half a second, uh, until they blink again and it's someone else's eye entirely. You also look different. And they gesture at you and the fact that you have pupils now. Did you oh. get taller? No, I'm told my eyes came back. I got some clothes. I don't know what happened to my clothes. Me neither. I don't know where my, it's the apocalypse and I don't know where my clothes are. Well, okay. I guess my clothes got taken by ravens, but I don't know where they took it. <sighs> this shit fucking sucks sometimes. It's weird they gave me like, a lot of this set of clothes, you know? Like, there's, like I have some more in my bag because they get dirty and you can change. I don't know if you chucked your bag for, like, more clothes. I only still have my hunting trap and stuff. Um, so I am, I wouldn't you say I'm sorry for, I, to be fair, I wrote you a letter back and then I 
uh, hid it in the back pocket of a guard and plan to never send it ever. Oh. You know that's not how the Indake Postal Service works, right? No, I am aware. I, I, I mm, was very angry, I think, at all of you paragons. But it is, it's okay. It's okay now. I am okay. I uh, have also been really angry at the paragons before, conceptually. Um, like yourself? So I get it. <laughs> Especially myself, oh. actually. I'm sorry, that sounds quite tormenting. But I, I understand it's it's hard to feel like you're on a, on a like, cart that won't, the driver won't listen to you. Yeah, I just hope that we don't get to our final destination before we can pull the wheels off, you know what I mean? No. Okay. And I think we cut away from Oka and Aviku to another side of this chamber where you are, Vasca. And I think Costas has approached you. Their hair is still like ruffled from being repelled and thrown all over the place. And they're sort of pacing around, like looking at this machine, looking at the tubing, and then they swivel and they fix their gaze upon you and they just immediately rush over. Hey, Vasca, Vasca, Vasca. Hey, 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 hey. Let me paint a picture of what Vasca's mind was at before Costas approached. And it was fixated on Dr. Luso's face when they said, I had built this machine, I think, a few years, for a few years ago. And if I may, Connie, I'd like to make an insight check of whether or not Dr. Luso believes that. Okay, make an insight check on Dr. O. That's a natural 19 with my insight of 17. What is that, a 36? A 36. Okay. <laughs> with, the, with the 36. As Dr. Aluso says that, you know that they they believe that what they are saying is true, but there's there's an undercurrent underneath that where they're not sure how it's possible. Because as you look at this machine, they said they built it a few years ago. They, uh, there's no way it only took a few years to create this chamber, or drill those holes, build this machine and the steel, unless you have an entire team of people working here. And Dr. Luso very specifically has worked alone up until this point. And you can tell with your 36 that they are even confused about how this was possible, but they haven't lingered on it for too long. The reason behind that, you won't be able to tell without. Oh, a oh absolutely. Yeah. This no, I'm not psychic. That's fine. But I think at that moment, there's like a moment where Vasca's face, like her eyes widen, her, her jaw drops a little bit as she remembers what Sitlali told her just before she died. And it is unsettling in real amount, and there's so many thoughts going through Vasca's head. As Costas' uh, voice cuts through all that, um, yes, yeah, um, sorry, I, yes, uh, what, what were you saying? I didn't, my mind was elsewhere. I forgive me. I have, I have the best idea ever, Vasca. Listen, listen, looking okay. at Abiku doing that like dope shit, and like Abiku becoming keeper of the Raven Queen while we were in the Iron Citadel, and and I just, uh, what if, what if I was your keeper? We've been traveling together for, for like a while now, for like almost a year. And you know me, I'm good with fighting. I've got my swords and I like you and you trust me and I trust you. And what if I was, what if you like made me keeper of Nabuza? I'd be able to help a lot more. I mean, I completely missed every single fucking piece of the action in Moreau's. Uh, and I feel like I didn't really contribute that much the last time we were in Moreau's either. And I, I just wanna, I just wanna be able to make a difference. You know what I mean? Uh, I I under I understand that I I understand you wanting to make a difference and this entire time as Vasca is saying this, her eyes are looking at Costas, looking back at Doctor Luso, looking at Costas, looking back at Doctor Luso, and is only half paying attention. And um, the question of maybe you make me the keeper of Nibus, and I'm like um uh, I don't I don't. I'll, I'm, I'll be honest with you, Costas. I don't understand how a keeper ship is granted, given I... Uh, you... And 
completely drops the topic of keepership as Costas talks about their usefulness and goes, Costas, you are an undeniable force of Strike Team A. Do not ever forget that. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, but just think how much more undeniably awesome I can be if I were undeniably a keeper. Like, I wonder what kind of clothes I'll get. What if I, like, what if the hood was gone and, like, I got maybe, like, like a leather thing? Or, like, ooh, maybe it could be, like, wraps, you know, like, like Shinka's statue was? Or maybe I could go topless or something? Ooh, do you think I'll get, like, a cool weapon like you? Uh, I, I, and I think, uh, Vasca is kind of tapping in a little bit at like finally honing in on this conversation of like is Costa's keeper and I think just mutters out just like almost like it's out of instinct I think it's for Nabusa to decide <sighs> Nabusa? Nabusa? Well oh, okay can you talk to her? Uh, put in like uh, a good word for me, you know what I mean? Because I feel like if we already have a pre-existing relationship that'll be like put me pretty high on the, on the resume pile um <laughs> I don't... I, I don't think that's how it works, Costas. Uh, I'm sorry, Costas. I am... And I think, like, by the time she, like, looks back at Dr. Lusso, they're already kind of, like, so far into their processing that there's nothing more she can discern and kind of turns fully towards Costas. And it's just like... What is this about, really? Why... Why do you want to be Keeper? Well, I just... I just really want it. I just think it'd, it'd be really cool to be strong and help my friends and all that stuff. And Costas continues to talk, but as they do, you feel Nitbuza inside you stir. Uh oh. But not in Costas's direction, in Gentles. And I think your eyes are. I think unbidden your eyes glaze past Costas's excitable face as they go on and on about all the cool powers they want and slide onto Gentle. And Gentle, what have you been up to this time? I think this is actually funny because I feel like I might have also made eye contact back. I, I've been sitting here tapping my feet, just like waiting, Bud's taking a breather. I think I even have my mask on to like reduce any like drag or anything as we move. Um, so I've just been like trying to like focus in and hone in on that feeling I had earlier with like the threads pulling me to see if I could get that pull again to help us like navigate through this easier. Um, I want to roll perception to see if that could help. Go for it. Make a perception check with advantage. Hell yeah. Okay. So that is a 28. Let me double check. Oh no, <laughs> my bad. 29. <laughs> We're in high, high level play now, baby. You feel that thread pulling you, a hook behind your navel, a red string of story and fate, pulling you sternum to sternum toward Vasca. And it's almost like the rest of the noises of, I think, the ambient humming of the machine, of Oka and Abiku talking, sort of fade down. And you focus on Vasca and Costas's discussion, and you hear the term keeper spill out excitedly from Costas's mouth. And for some reason, that seems to linger in the air for you, gentle, uh, as that thread almost like connects to Vasca at the exact same time the two of you make eye contact. I think I like, I walk over, um, just, um, hi, uh, how are you two doing with everything? Oh, uh, v Vasca's, like, Vasca's gonna make me keep her, right, Vasca? Is that, like, a thing you can do? Well, Vasca said she'd ask, right? I think Vasca has this long stare at Gentle as this is happening, and it almost feels like every other bit of this place disappears for a moment where Nebusa stirs within her, and she feels this tug of fate and I imagine that she places her hand on her chest as she feels that pull from her sternum. And I think Vasca will really absent-mindedly because she's currently full of Nibusa's fervor in this moment, just say, it's you. Me? This this pool, it's, it's unmistakable, it is undeniable, and I, Connie, if you will allow, Vasca pulls at what seems to everyone else 
as a nothingness in the air, but it's actually the thread between Gentle and Vosca. And she will gently pluck it like a string of a glutein. Can I see that happening? You feel it like music resonating through the deepest parts of your marrow, pleasant and fateful. You felt uh, that, didn't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, what, what, what? Okay, hold on, pause, pause, pause. Uh, what the fuck is happening? And I think one more time, Vasca plays like a tune onto the string between the two of them that is this low hum like a songbird and there is this kind of like pleasantly surprised smile that I feel is like imbued from Nibuza's own emotions at connection and choice that Vasca just says she's chosen you well uh, g- g- uh, gentle uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna take that, right? Cause I, I mean, I know. Cause, I mean, I mean, dibs. <laughs> um, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that necessarily how that works. I don't. Well, well no I mean, one I... knows how it works. Who's this? How do you know how it works? Huh? It's a choice, right? That's the point. This is a choice. So gentle. I mean, I, you're a really nice person, right? You're like super nice and kind and generous. That's like your whole thing. Can you just like, you don't need this. You're, you're, you're like a really cool monk stuff. You have your wolf thing. Can I, can I, can I have this please? I mean, maybe you also don't need this. You also incredibly talented and part of strike team A for a reason. Oh, come on. Both of you know that's a load of... And that's when Dr. Uso whirls around uh, and they say, it's done. We have to go now. Well, you heard them, everybody. Let's go. And Abiku gets up and it, I think starts heading for the only way she knows. Is how she has no idea where we're going. <laughs> no, that's right. Abi, uh, Abiku, you see Dr. Uso turn and also run back toward the tunnel that the, all of you came down from. And as they do, they sort of whirl their left palm open and a, a sphere of blue light whips into existence. It almost kind of looks like a globe, uh, but there's some sort of like a, a, a little dot floating in some sort of like cerulean ichor. And it seems to be like a navigational orb. Like the dot sort of seems to be pointing toward the bottom and also out toward the tunnel. Uh, so instead of like knowing exactly where it's coming from, this thing is like a compass that points toward it, if that makes sense but it's three-dimensional because the, the chasm goes down. Hearing what Dr. Luso says kind of turns back at the two of them, but her eyes are on gentle, very focused. And she says, the, what she's saying is directed at the both of them, but her gaze is focused on gentle. We'll speak more of this later. And we'll begin like rushing after Abiku. <clears throat> yes, we will, yes. Yes, we will. Uh, and Costas turns and also hoofs it. I think Gentle nods and just says, understood, knowing knowing the context of this, and goes to get Bud and make sure that he's ready for the next round of this. And I think Oka, as they're like coming out, uh, I think maybe almost last, they, they kind of brush up against uh, Gentle and they're like, where, uh, where Juran and Sitlali, Mercy, where did they go? Uh, I think they went towards the big beam of light in the sky it looked like the teleporter I, I think it's URL stuff but I don't, don't really know a ton about it and Oka gets a look on their face as they remember that ship, that fucking ship Connie, you bastard um, they get this look on their face and they're like that's really not the time for the house to split uh, but they follow after uh, sticking close on gentle seal back in the chasm the chaos continues. Creatures rampage up narrow ledges. They clamber rocks all around you. They swing from protruding roots. They tunnel upward. They burrow. They fly. Everyone and everything is fleeing the Euclid. Everyone but, of course, the four of you. 
And now at the entrance to Dr. Eluso's machine, at the very aperture of this tunnel, the vast gulf looms underneath your feet. All around you, stony walls rise. Thick outcroppings of rock are veined with untapped ore. Naturally formed ledges jut from these rugged cliffs. The other side of the chasm, as well as the murky depths beneath, are bathed in a thick white mist. Abiku, this depth of the chasm is around where you woke up. It's also about as deep as you went at the deepest point when you crossed the Euclid with the Kirtal crew uh, back in Arc 5. Uh, you haven't gone deeper past this point, certainly not into the mists. And I think deep underneath you, to all of you, these stones and that white opaque fog beckon. What do y'all do? Can I use my brand new keeper power that I got this morning? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. You can use. The I don't know. I don't know if it's like because uh, I were like rushing around. I, I wasn't sure if I need to like sit or if it's like a. I it's like a brain split where like I'm moving, but like I'm also talking. Or but I would. I think if anyone might be able to help us, it might be someone who's lived ten thousand years ago. If this thing's like older than old, like because that's what I was told by that seedling was something's down there that's like older than old. That is true. Uh, why don't you do it? Why don't you like read out what that keeper power is uh, yeah. and describe how it manifests for you? So this morning I was awoken with delight. Not that it, I first thing I read this morning, uh, Abiku's keeper power, ancestral energy. Uh, once per long rest, I can ask an ancestor a single question and I get something interesting, like helpful, interesting or actionable to, as an answer. When I'm done commuting, I get a good advice dice that I can use to replace an attack roll, saving throw, or skill check the next until the next time I use a feature. So it goes away. If I do it again, I don't get to save them like a little, like, like pile them away somewhere like a rabbit saving carrots for winter. I don't know what rabbits do. Uh, I'm not actually BQ. Uh, so yeah, I would like to do that. What is the specific guidance you're trying to find? Like, what is your specific problem you're trying to ha have some solutions for? And how mm -hmm. are you calling upon your ancestors for this ancestral eulogy? I am looking for guidance on what is at the bottom of the chasm. I'm looking for guidance on, like, what is down there and how to be ready for it. Just can Truecraft do- I think I'd use, like, uh, some kind of mix of, like, Druidcraft and Preservation to, like, bring some of the mist up to me and, like, inhale it as, like, it, like, this stuff- like, no one goes down here, this is, like, old air. It's not how air works, everybody, but- <laughs> I love that. As you inhale these mists, uh, I think your eyes cloud over once more. Like they cover mm -hmm. your orange irises and pupils as you enter almost like a trance-like state for like half a second in real time. But you like it's long enough for you to almost like receive answers and have a conversation for you in your own mind. And mm -hmm. it's like as you inhale these mists, they swirl around in your mind and a voice bubbles to the surface of this murk. A voice that is at once unfamiliar and familiar. This is the voice of a gigantic mage, a sage, uh, that you have, I think, interacted with back when you were still alive. Someone with deep knowledge of the gigantic mages' histories, their cultures, their pasts. Mm -hmm. And this voice, I think, is dripping in this druidic wisdom, like an old branch covered with moss. Mm -hmm. And you hear her say, Legends, my dear Ishtar, legends tell of some ancient, forgotten thing at the bottom of the world, beyond even the purview of the eight. Wait, if it's... So is it a forgotten god? If it's older than the eight, what, what could be older than the eight? That I know not, child. 
But what is underneath the realms, underneath our queendoms, underneath your Andake, has never seen the light of our day. And it's sort of this connection that the Raven Queen has blessed you with that allows you to maintain, I think, this open line with this ancestral guidance. And also because I think the after is back. Uh, uh, you, I do not know uh, how long I can maintain this, so I must ask, do the legends say we should fear it? Or is it a friend? Fear is a very interesting emotion for us, child. Certainly, the farther down you go, the less power our gods may have. Is that to be feared? No. If fearing the unknown is what had me running around the world for a year unsure of myself. And Enkibiku touches where her non-beating heart is. Whatever is down there, we will find. And if it is a friend, we will bring it back and make sure people don't forget the way we, and she like gestures to like the spirit, the way our story was forgotten. But if it is a foe, I won't fail again. Thank you child the gods are with you they are with you all thank you may you rest i am sorry to disturb you not a disturbance always a welcome prayer and i think the voice drifts away and your eyes become unclouded once more everyone i have something important but uh, what what um so the thing at the bottom of the chasm is older than has never seen the light of day like like it is older than this place that you all call Ndake that I was part of a kingdom and it is even the age do not fully know what is down there incomprehensible to the eight are you certain about this I well I talked to a spirit of an oracle who I trusted when I was alive and I assume I assume in death they have only gained more knowledge. I mean, they can talk to so many of the spirits, you know? They, they probably know a lot now. That... I... I... I don't understand. The chasm <sighs> was created when the stranger's body fell into Andake. It broke open the earth. Maybe it was trying to get to something. Or someone. And Oko leans back and away. This will be the first and likely the last time I say this, but we don't have time to theorize. We have to yes. go. Yes, I just wanted to make sure you are all aware whatever we are going to is, it's not just like unknown to us, it is known, known to, to them as well in gestures, like like outward, like for the eight. Like no one can help us. We are on our own. Guess we have to do our best then. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> yes, our best. We will all, we'll all rally together and we'll count on each other and the power of friendship and all, all that. Yeah, <clears throat> like I said. Everyone stay within my eyesight. If you fall down further, I may be able to help and will immediately pull out her flute and begin uh, playing music. Bosca, a rallying symphony explodes from your flute, uh, even as I think you start to repel downward yourself, still swinging parable in the other hand. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And Costas, I think actually, your hands are full, but they also insist on getting down there themselves to sort of like prove themselves. They start to like scale rock to rock. They're fairly proficient and athletic, uh, but they are kind of throwing themselves recklessly forward. They're one of the first people to just jump downward from the lip and begin to scale into the fog. What about the rest of you? Knowing we don't have time, Vika just kind of looks at Vasco, like 
like the like what is like the mental like what is he doing what what are, what are they up to what is there i i think voska <laughs> looks to you with this very familiar look of her not understanding either of of what's going on which is very strange because voska is usually very insightful and pays a lot of attention and a beaker <laughs> i think you would discern that even when you're asking this of voska she is distracted her gaze falling on gentle only notices for a beat and i feel like feels like dark like dark just like we gotta go we gotta, we gotta go and a bq just starts like is like jumps down like costas wait <laughs> i think gentle looks at dr o and it's like um could you, you i saw the little like platform thingy could you do that for bud ah uh, yes of course i can just i can make it bigger uh bud and dr Aluso steps off the ledge and boom, boom, shimmering into existence like a hard light platform uh that bud quickly s- skitters onto all right uh and i like get in front of bud and like kneel down a little you'll be okay with dr o i'm gonna be a little bit ahead just to make sure things are safe i'll be okay. fine all right you can trust dr o Understood. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I feel like I, I can trust her. Uh, just, uh, everyone, i just like to request that we stay together as, as much as we can. I don't want to be able to not smell you. I, I can smell you pretty far, so if I can't smell you, that's really bad. Gotcha. Um, if if that starts being a problem, have Dr. O make your voice louder. And, okay. And, like, lift my mask and give a very, like, uh, loving and confident, like, smile that it's gonna be okay. And I put it right I, back I down. I can howl. I can howl really loud, gentle. I know. Perfect. And I jump down there with uh, uh, Abiku and Vasca. C- could we all hear Bud in that instance? Yes, Bud was talking. Barding inspiration to the dog. Absolutely. <laughs> Yay! I feel like a note pings in Bud's direction and they like, he glows a little bit as it reaches his fur. I I play my flute in a howl note that would match like a wolf's howl. I love that. I think Oka is standing on the lip of this ledge. Uh, they look terrified, I think. Like, they genuinely look, like, scared uh, for the first time. Like, there is this nightmare pay- playing on repeat behind their eyes. And for the first time, they're not grabbing a hold of their own heartbeat and schooling it down. Because now that all of the animals and all the monsters and all the emissaries have left, like they're like leaving out of the chasm. They're pretty much gone by now, I imagine. It's really quiet. And Oka has gotten used to being able to hear the heartbeats of everyone around them, including the mice, including the birds, including everything, which is just this like low, almost like brown noise, right? Machine going on in their mind all the time to help them calm down. And it's gone. And now they can only pick out the heartbeats of like gentle, Vasca, Dr. O, Bud, Costas, not even a Biku, and they are refusing to actually bring their own heartbeat down to a place where it's not pounding in their ears because they don't want to hear that silence in between the notes of everyone else's heart. And they stand there for a moment before they just kind of look up, and they keep their gaze up as much as they can, trying to see that last little bit of starlight before they just kind of grab the front of their shirt and just tip forward. And like that, all of you descend into the mist. It's like diving into a cloud. Few and Dawkins have plunged this fog and returned, and those who do, tales say, are shaken, irrevocably changed for the worse. Certainly none of you have ever gone this deep. And I think as soon as your ears submerge into the mists, the sounds of panic, chaos, screaming that were maybe reverberating higher up in like an upper strata of the chasm, it all just vanishes, muffles, like a pillow being pressed against your eardrums. And like the deeper you go, 
the thicker this fog gets until very quickly, like only a few moments pass before I think you realize this is happening. The only objects you can perceive are the bodies of your fellow party mates around you. Like those outcroppings of rock, those natural bridges of stone, those veins of ore, all of these things fade into the murk. And occasionally as you like go down, I think as Bud and Dr. Lucer are on this disc and like descending, occasionally whipping past them is like a dark silhouette of something. A rock, maybe? Or the yawning entrance to a cavern or something else? But you're not entirely sure you're moving a little too fast. So how do the four of you, I think, as the mists close in and the only people you can see are each other, because you're traveling kind of as a group, how do you continue your descent without getting lost from each other? Ibiki takes out her fan and is going to, like, put, like, gusts of wind around us to try and keep the mists from, like, so we don't uh, lose sight of each other. She's like, we should still stay close, but and she just, like, back and forth and back and forth. This will make sure we can see each other. You're on sun, right? Yes. Make either an acrobatics, sleight of hand, or nature check for me. I will do acrobatics. Ooh, that's a natural 20 for 31. Oh my god! That is a critical success. As you gust your fan around your party mates, this mist whips away, almost like forming a sphere of clarity around your group. But you have to keep doing it because these mists will close back in the instant there isn't any wind. Like the instant. It's like fog on the edges of a sphere waiting to drip its wet claws into your vision and your periphery. But a biku. And all of you see, like, clearing in a sphere around you, let's say maybe um, 30 feet above all of you, 30 feet beneath, 30 feet out to the left, and 30 feet out to the right, is cleared. Uh, And you sort of, like, this fog of war lifts, and you see rock and chasm and veins of ore and little landings and outcroppings. It is still the chasm, it's just bathed in mist, and it just keeps going down. Like, the mist does not end, it just keeps going. Like you, you keep descending for, for a long time. How are the rest of you responding to this? I think Oka noticing what Abiku is doing, they have to focus on something. So they're staying particularly close to Abiku because they can hear everyone else's heartbeats. And I think they're uh, trying to beat, like in between them, like using their wing beats to stay afloat and like to fly down. They're also trying to use their wings in the same uh, motion and momentum as a Biku to help facilitate the air going around. I really like that. Oka, as you also are like flying and contributing to the wind whipping all around you, you feel Sen. The deeper you go, this god shard rises up until you feel their presence coiling around the interior of your soul like a fox pacing its cage. Sen is beginning to feel anxious. Oka too is beginning to feel anxious. Bosca, what about you? I hate that you did that because now what I want to do is is ripe for the picking for Connie Chang, our GM. Um, Cause I imagine the deeper and deeper we go, as you said, we are plunging through cloud. It gets harder and harder for Bosca to play her flute. It's difficult to take the breaths necessary to keep the sound going, so she tucks the flute away and relies on Parable to make music so that everyone knows that where she is and she can use that to kind of like locate where folks are and just using Parable while rappling down. I really like that. Similar to Oka, as you put your flute away and like a incense sensor, repelling parable from branch to outcroppings to like horizontal stalagmite to landing. You feel Nibuza rise up in your soul and like the edges of her presence are frayed, like a tapestry starting to come undone. Similar to like Sen pacing that cage. For you, anxiety from Nibuza feels like cloth beginning to unravel. That does not feel good as Vasca lands out of breath and haggard. And then we pan over to Gentle. 
So, I think the one thing that Gentle, like, tends to be very good at is they are incredibly perceptive. And I think they are sort of listening for the way the wind is moving. Uh, and finding those moments of, like, oh, there's definitely something obstructing this. You know, logic dictates there's probably a rock or something here. And just knowing the best way of, like, all right, let's go here, here, here. And just trying to make this path as optimal as possible. You're flying down, right, with your flying shoes? Yep. Cool. It's almost like I think you're like treading through air as you like clear a path and maybe even help guide a biku and this like general sphere of clarity of all your friends farther, deeper down into the mist. And Costas is, I think, climbing at like a similar rate as Voska at this point, who's starting to run out of breath. But the two of you are also, you're not left behind. You're all still traveling together as a unit. You go down deeper, deeper deeper. You are maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred feet down when the mist vanishes. All at once, like you've crossed an invisible threshold. Uh, you feel the cold droplets of fog on the edges of the sphere. I think some of it Went, got past the wind wall and is still clinging to your backs, your hair, your clothes a little bit. And if you twist at the waist and look up, the mist is still right there. But it just kind of stops. And underneath the four of you is the canopy layer of a jungle. And we are going to cut to break there. Uh, so we'll oh, be back in 10 minutes. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh... Enjoy the music, Pijo, Pijo. Welcome back, everybody, to Arc 7, Episode 2 of Transplanar RPG. Let's get right back into the jungle. Uh, content warnings for this episode and the campaign in general may include fantasy violence, body horror, gore, blood and bloodletting, apocalypse, trauma and grief, death of loved ones, familial struggles, complex and complicated relationships, romance and references to sexual entanglements, earthquakes, heights and falling, vast depths, vast and unknowable bodies of water, and swimming. Use exclamation point CW at any time for a full list of these content warnings, and let's get back into the session. Oka, Abiku, Gentle, and Voska. Underneath the four of you, like I said, is a vast, humid, emerald green jungle, thicker than the Paluto Weald. It spreads through this entire space from north to south, east to west, as far as the eye can see underneath you. A veritable viridescent ocean. And you see remainders of that mist. <laughs> Hold on, no wait, those are clouds. Hovering above a dense, bristling series of fronds. If you're looking at like the Amazon jungle from an aerial view, you can't see anything else. It's just green. This is the exact same situation. So all I can describe right now is green in every direction. For those of you who are not flying, so Vasca and Costas, the last stalagmite that you can repel on before you free fall sort of dangles uh, from the lip of what feels and seems to be like a massive just drop. Like the floor just bottoms out and forms a hole. Fuck. Costas was ahead of me. Costas falls. They were expecting to be able to step onto or grab onto something else, and they just don't, and they start to fall. I try cool. to catch Costas. <laughs> I was gonna try the same thing. Gentle, do you wanna I... do you wanna give it a shot, Gentle? Yeah. Do I have to roll anything? Yes. Uh make me an acrobatics check. Yep. Once again, another 29. <laughs> How do you save Costas? Costas is fine. It's this. It's very Superman, honestly. It is just the like scoop up and like I have full like move movement control in these winged uh, sandals. So I'm just like, are are you okay? As you grab onto Costas, they've let out like a hoarse scream as they're just free falling. They were not expecting this, and you dip underneath them and catch them, and they let out. Oh, oh, oh my God! Oh, thank you. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I was fine. I could have. 
gotten that, I uh, <clears throat> I can't fly, but um, like everyone else in this party can. So it was either gonna be you, or Oka was gonna save me, or Doctor O, or Abiku, or you know even Vasca. He could fly, right? Right, Vasca? Or do you think uh, Nabuza would be able to give me the ability to fly? You are within earshot of this, Vasca, and as you're hanging, I think, if it's all right, like you're sort of hanging at the lip, like using yeah. parable, you're kind of swinging, you look down, and that anxious fraying of Nibuza has only intensified. Like as soon as you broke through cloud cover and slipped a bit and grabbed onto parable, it like, like a, a thread of stability snaps and just frays at the edges. Hey, Connie, can I give you rights? Yeah, um, go ahead. Give me some rights. As soon as that happens, parable phrase and loses tautness against the stalagmite. And you fall. And Vasca falls. Dibs on this one. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Jesus. Gotta get everybody some wings or something around here. Come on, everybody. I'm sorry. I did get the what Paragon I... wings. <laughs> I got the sexy snady window top. <laughs> you gotta, when they send the email, you gotta make sure you check the box for wings. Uh, what am I wrong? Acrobatics to like direct uh, sun, right? To cash Vasca. 29 also. You direct sun toward Vasca, and this obsidian drake cuts through the air and catches you on his back as soon as you land. Right, Vasca? So you like fall a short distance and poof, like one leg on either side of their back, and you're caught and you're safe. You look startled? I know you fell, but like, you never look startled. Thank you. And I think like Vasca like taps you on the leg when, when you like. Am I sitting in front of you or behind you? I just realized I'm uncertain where the positioning is. Behind, I like turn, I think I casually turn around like, like she's, she feels very comfortable on sun. So I like yeah. turn around like <laughs> all the way and sits the opposite way. <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> hey babe. Hey babe, you good? Yeah, more or less she's like, I, you look, you look worried. You've, I've never seen you look worried. It's worrying me because you're never worried. Should I be worried? I... Thank you, I... And, like, Vasca's, like, holding on to you because she's never flown on sun before and she just fell and she's, like, grabbing onto her chest. I... I feel... I feel the god shard. She's... The abuse us. This, this is bad. And, like, Vasca looks at Parable and if I may, Connie, this, like, it's almost like the threads that hold Parable, like the tautness of the rope, is loose. Almost like, like a spring, it's loosened. It doesn't hold the same tightness. I... And she goes, Parable. Yes. I did not want to worry Oka. They s seem to already have a lot going on. But you'll want to hold, Abiga turns on, hold on, uh, the oracle told me the gods may not be able to reach you down here. And speaking oh. of Oka, we swivel up to you. I think as you're sort of beating your wings, taking this in for a minute, you feel Sen, that pacing in that cage of your soul, growing more and more frantic. Like, almost like a sort of rabidity is beginning to creep up through Sen. Not like corruption, but fear is manifesting in the way that it does in the natural world. This kind of unbridled, frothing, foaming at the mouth. But there's like still a stopper on it. It hasn't completely exploded yet. And similar to Parable starting to distend in Vasca's hands, I think the halos, the interlocking eight different rings behind your uh, head start to move of their own accord. Like, and you can sort of feel like, you see your hand glitch, similar to when you're like teleporting off a dais and your molecules just sort of discorporate kind of like that glitching. And on your left hand, you see scales come over your fingers and then fur, and then it's skin again. Oh no, Oka just had a identity crisis. They are not ready to have a second one. And I think they almost like fall for a second bef like because they forget to beat their wings, right? Uh, when they notice this and they fall just a few feet um, before catching themselves again. They're like, no, 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 no,
You, 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 you have all of you, you have all of you, all of you, you have all of you, you have all of you. Uh, and they are looking like as Vasca has fallen and Costas has fallen and they pull up as like Dr. Eluso and Bud come through the mist on their, uh, what I feel like is a floating dinner plate. And they are barely holding on, barely holding it together. And, uh, what the fuck is that? I, uh... And this is Dr. Eluso, who has paused those, like, floating plates of hard light. I... I have no idea. I've... I've never... I've never been down this far before. I... I, uh... I'm sorry, what was the question? What... what is going on? What is... why is oh, there yeah, a... Yes. Of course, it looks to be like a, a a a jungle. And Bud like turns to look at Dr. Lisa and is like, uh, I can't see color and I know that's a jungle. Are, are you okay, Dr. O? Uh yes, um, it must be the mist. Uh, I'm feeling a little um I'm feeling a little out of it. I don't I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh uh Well, as long as you don't drop me from this disc, uh Oh, right, right, yes, of course, bud. No, uh, no, of course. Let's, um... Uh, and they, like, fling their palm up to consult, like, the compass. Uh, th- uh, this way, this way. And they continue, like, floating downward and kind of, like, northward, uh, but also going down at the same time, like, toward the canopy level. I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 of course, just keep following. Uh... Do these trees look like normal trees? Like, are they trees any of us uh, rec- can yeah. I Can I <laughs> make a roll about these trees? All of you can roll nature. As you float and fly down toward the canopy and the fronds get bigger and bigger and bigger and more detail blooms into view, you get to roll nature. What did y'all get? I don't have expertise in this, so I only have a plus five and I rolled a seven, so... <laughs> Okay, well, that's why maybe you're still tree like, girl. you're not a tree girl and you're still kind of like, oh my God, what's going on with Parable, right? So it makes sense that you're a little yep, distracted. And Dr. Luso is also being very weird and Vasco is just like, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, go ahead, Oka. Oka got a 19. Okay, gentle. I got a seven. I'm blaming that on Costas and the fact new trees potentially means new tea. Sure. Abiku? Uh, synthetic 20. Oka and Abiku, as you drift closer and closer to this canopy level, and eventually I think you break through, like past this like layer of the upper strata of these woods. These trees, hmm, these fronds, this bark, these fungi growing out of the bark are nothing like you've ever seen before, ever, in any part of Endake. Like these are brand new species. Like, like, okay, like, they don't, uh, sorry, not to get all tree nerd, like, they are, like, from the same family or genus of tree we are used to, or they are, like, it's like, you see a oak tree, and then you only know oak trees, and then for the first time ever, you see, like, an evergreen tree. Uh, it's like knowing what a whale is, and then seeing a lion. Okay, yeah, so yeah, completely, like, this is... Like, this fits into the category of tree, and that's it. Yes. The Perfect. only, okay. like, anyone who, like, the 9 and the 13, you'll be like, that's a tree. It's a little weird looking, maybe. I've never seen a tree quite like that, but that's a tree. Maybe I'm just not an arborist. But y'all, like, Oka and Abiku, Abiku, you're a ranger. You're a survivalist. You know nature. And Oka, you're a monster hunter. You've been in every corner of Endake and have tracked monsters through their lairs. You've never seen trees like this, ever, before. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to process. We should not touch these trees. Costas has been in the middle of like reaching out fingers to like grab at some, I think, Sweet fungal. summer child, I will tie you up. <laughs> <laughs> if you say that out loud, I think I'm close to Costas and I will just like politely like hand on like top of hand of like, let's not. You're holding Costas. They can't I'm fly. still holding Costas. Yeah, oh, so they're boy. in your arms, gentle, as they reach out a hand yep. and you use your other hand to bring it down and they go, <clears throat> excuse me? What am I, like a fucking Sorry. child? 
no, but you, new things shouldn't be messed with yet, especially if Abiku has an idea on not to mess with them. What? Abiku, this is a mushroom, okay? And that's a leaf, and that's a flower, and that's a bird. And all of you see a bird. As you continue to descend, first of all, these trees are really tall, okay? You're still descending. You're still descending through the canopy layer. And I think on a branch, you all see a bird. It looks, at first, you're like, that's a toucan? It has a really big beak. Uh, and But the beak isn't very colorful. And it has feathers, but they look more fur-like than feather-like. And then the bird turns its head, and you realize it's not a bird. It's maybe some sort of... Monkey isn't the right word. It is an animal. It is a beast with a really long face that just protrudes outward instead of, like, being flat. And so long that it looked like a beak, but you realize it's a mouth. Like, not a mouth with teeth in it, but a mouth with, like, lips. You all look at this creature as it turns its head, and I think it looks at you all head on as you all continue to descend through the canopy level. And it doesn't, like, attack or anything, but head on, you realize it has an eye that bends over its nose. So it's like a single eye that's shaped like a crescent that just sort of bands over, like, the top of its maw. And the eye has just one pupil in it that swivels on either direction and takes you all in. What do you want us to do, Connie? Think... What do you want us to do, Connie? <laughs> what do you want us to do? Connie, now, now do something, us. <laughs> do what? <laughs> You're like, here's, here's a Robocop bird, I don't know. Here is the most fucked up bird you've ever seen in your life. What are you gonna do about it? I actually think it would be hilarious if you all just like kept going down. <laughs> like past it. This is some biblical angel meets attack on Titan unhinged nonsense you just throw out with me. I think I think it's good because Custis is like, and that's a bird, and we all look at it, <laughs> and we just like I think we just silently look back at Costas. <laughs> I uh, I uh, I stand corrected, Doctor O. What the fuck is this thing place? Where are we? Are we still on? And okay, what what is this place? What is happening, Doctor O? That's actually a really good question. Um, since. In the last arc, uh, Sen took us through time, space, and reality. Could I try to figure out, like, if this is and doc, like, where, if we are in, like, a demi plane, or if we're in the chasm and this is just what's at the bottom of the chasm? Like, can I try to figure out, or, like, if we're in a different time period? Oka doesn't know, right? Can I try roll to figure Arcana. that out? Yeah, roll Arcana for me. Any, I think anyone who wants to can, but okay, you can roll with advantage because of the time loop. 25. I got a Natural 14. One. I got a Natural 1, which is, which is, which is like absolutely perfect. Abiku, I can't stress enough, has never opened a book in her life. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And this also doesn't ping anything ancestrally for you, Abiku, I think is what that natural one means. There's a kind of feeling in the pit of your stomach as you recall what the ancestral voice told you, the sage, like never seen the light of our sun and as you like continue to descend I think that kind of dark feeling starts to spread through you like you are out of your depth here like this is not like this isn't thousand year war flora and fauna either Oka this is still hmm define define for me what you mean by is this still Andake uh like, is this still the now? The now. Yes. Kind of. I knew it was coming. It's kind of like, um... So, Oka, as you continue to descend through the canopy, you think about the now, and you're like, is this the now? Are we in a different plane of existence? Is this a different reality? A time period? Is this prehistoric Endake that we don't know it? Like, what is going on? None of those things are quite right. 
this is more like, this isn't another time. You're still in the same time, actually. You're not thrown out of time. This is still like 406AT. What exactly even is the boundary between the now and the after? Academics say it's the ethereal plane, but that's just our perspective as people. Can you truly chart the difference between something that's small and large? At what point does it become small or large? Is it a certain number of feet? At what point does purple become red or blue? Or is it just up to you? Is there a specific like pixelation that must occur for red to turn to blue? Or is that subjective? So is this Andake? Is this the now? Yes, but also no, but also maybe it's turning into something else. Oka takes that in and then gives a really sidelong look at Vasca, I think. Uh, Vasca responds with that same sidelong glance of, uh, this is, I, I think, like, she, in that glance, like, lifts up Parable to show, like, its condition, and then fixate her glance on, how's Dr. Luso taking this other than trying to tell us this is a jungle? I think at this point, you all have broken past the canopy layer. You're in, like, the next layer up. The fronds here are different. They were, like, bright green up top, but here they're multicolored. Uh, some of them even look like they're made of glass. Uh, and there's just sort of, like, ever-present light everywhere. There's no sun in here, but there's just light. And, like, the glass sort of, like, filters these rainbow colors. The light, like, comes through it like a prism. And it, like, refracts these different beams of hues upon the flora all around you. You're in, like, the kind of, like, glittering, rainbow, glassy, green, multicolored jungle scape right now as you continue to descend. You still haven't seen a forest floor, and you don't know where these trees are growing out of. You haven't seen roots yet, but you do see branches. And Dr. Aluso continues to levitate Bud and themselves down on these discs, and their face is kind of, like, blank. Their eyebrows are pinched. There's a bit of, like, darkness, I think, in their brow. Like, they're thinking of something completely unrelated to what they're doing right now, they look kind of far away. I don't like that. Vasca also does not like that. Uh, and will sit herself closer to Abiku to kind of like keep Dr. Lusa within their sights. Because if the doctor is out of their depth, holy fuck are the rest of us out of our depth. And I think Oka kind of like almost tucks their wings in because they don't want to get far from anyone. And I think they even like land next to Bud and Dr. Luso on the dais. And they, I think, are also kind of a little distracted and looking around at everything. As you all continue to take this place in, you break through to the third layer underneath the canopy to find, I think, you see the ground now. There's a ground. Uh, these trees are really long and thin, almost like pencils, like sticking out of the ground, but they're really, really, really tall. And this final layer, like the next like 20 to 30 feet of the trunk have no branches and no leaves coming out of it. It's like they just sort of like open up, almost like a coniferous like cone branching all the way up to the top. And you see like the ground is kind of like a grayish brownish tan color instead of like a nice rich earthen brown that you all would be used to or even like the red clay of the badlands or something like that it's kind of just like yellowish tan uh, and it seems to be covered in they look like pine needles that's like the closest comparison so maybe the tan isn't even the real ground it's just like this layering of residue or something and as you all like continue to float and drift down all of you see a skeleton it's sort of nestled on one of the final branches and it looks to be a person, like an actual person, but they have like adventuring gear on and they look like the, like you, there, there's, the skull is not there. The skull has like fallen off of the vertebrae, but it's like just, it's just skeleton. Like this person has been dead for like a really, really, really long time. Uh, I think I'm gonna try to like fly myself and cast this over to it. Uh, and just like, do you, do you mind seeing if they had any notes or anything on their person about this place? 
Yeah, uh, you know, I was just gonna mm, suggest that. Yeah, so why don't, yeah, fly me over, fly me over, gentle, thank you. <clears throat> and Costas approaches with you, this skeleton, and they quickly, like, dig through pockets and whatnot, and they pull out, I think, a single note uh, from a pocket that's kind of, like, folded up, and they, like, unfurl it, and they sort of, like, narrow their eyes at it, and they go, ah, oh, fuck, this is, like, this is old. I don't know if this is Ba or something. Uh, Dr. Luso, Abiku, can you take a look at this? It's not written in a language I, I understand. Hey, you sure? I'll fly sun over there and see if it's in Ba or some other like language I might at least recognize by sight. It is not written in Ba, but it does look to be like ancient Tew, maybe? Like it looks more like Gambit of Queen's era. I cannot help you, sorry. Uh, Oka, I think, after taking a few minutes on the platform, also kind of steps off and flies over to where they are. They take a look at the note, but it's probably too ancient for them to make out. Yeah, it is. The only person in your party who'd be able to read this would be Dr. Eluso. Uh, Sagu. Sagu. Mm -hmm. Um, can you take a look at this? Oh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yes, 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 of course. And they sort of float over with Bud in tow. Bud, who is, like, giving Dr. Luso a sidelong look, like their nose is twitching as Dr. Luso floats them over, and they take the note. Oh, let's see, they adjust their glasses, which keep, like, slipping down the bridge of their nose. Um, ah, yes, this is written in an ancient, uh, two, which is two before two is two. Oh, I'm saying two a lot. Uh, roughly, it translates to, um... It's an explorer's edict. It's someone who is uh, declaring that they're going to scope ahead and try to... Something about plunging into the chasm, into the mists, to see what no one has ever seen before. This person, I think, was likely an adventurer maybe 5,000 years ago or so, based on... Wow, I can't believe this this piece of paper has preserved for so long. Uh, maybe I would date it 2,000 to 5,000 years ago. I think Vasca is like looking at Gentle as we're looking over this body and uh, kind of tilts her head and she goes, did they fall and like looks up? I think they might have got, got on the canopy on the way down, Perhaps. at least for some of it. I mean, but still, it's a, it's a, what, we are over, over 1,500 feet down here. They must have gone part way down before their fall continued. Because the force, even with the canopy breaking their fall, certainly there's, they found a way down here before us. Yeah, and then wait. fell. You, oh, you said the stranger made the cousin? That's what the stories, we, that's what the books have said. Every, the one book that talks about the Stranger War, the things that we've seen in our, in our dreams, uh, the stranger falling to the earth and where its body fell, it cracked open the earth and made the chasm. Why would they come down? Explorers explore. That's what they do. Adventurers adventure. It also doesn't make sense. This these woods are older than five thousand years. Y yes, the, so the, these trees. Like, I I have not. I I've never seen trees this big, and I was alive and everything was big. That was like the whole thing. I'm I'm sorry, Doctor. How do you know that? Well, I mean, Abiku's right. These trees are big, which means they would need time to grow. But you could argue, why would these trees obey the same growth rates of trees on Andake? Maybe this place is only 5,000 years old. To which I would reply, um, uh, I'm, uh, I don't know. It just feels, it feels older than 5,000 years. Can insight I check? Uh, insight check. <laughs> I don't believe them for a fucking second. Insight check. Roll it, baby. Yeah, I'm I'm vibe checking. But... Uh, could I do medicine on Dr. O to see if they're like giving off any sort of like vibes of illness or anything? Sure. Okay, why don't you make make a wisdom medicine check? 
that already might be what it is. <laughs> so it, yeah. it was, and I was going to be nice to not tell you. <laughs> the duality of my dice. Uh, this was a nat 20 for 30. <laughs> Only ones are 20s over here, baby. So I guess be ready. <laughs> wow, that is... I got a 21. That's still uh, good. I, I've rolled a 14 plus 11. 25. 25. Uh, I got a 18. Abiku, you got a 30? Because he had an out 20? Okay. Dr. Aluso, the deeper you all have gone into the chasm, the more dissociated it seems like they're getting. Like there's something else internally happening with them that's like pulling their focus away. And it's it, regarding dating the trees, you get the sense that they are they are convinced they are right. Like they feel very confident that these trees are indeed over 5,000 years old, like much older, but they don't really know how they know that. Do, okay. Do they seem the same kind of unease as Vasco and Oka seem to be? Yeah, it, actually, like there's something soul-based maybe? With Dr. Aluso, yeah. with your natural 20, yeah. It's a similar kind of distraction and anxiety. I imagine, because like knowing Vasco so well, just like, and the fact that she told me, like, something's fucked. So it feels like that. Okay. Gentle, what did you get for your medicine check? 18. Then you would know very similar to what Abiku just found out, which is that it seems what's ailing Dr. Aluso is similar, but not quite the same as what's ailing Oka and Vasca. I, like, wherever Dr. O is, like, staring into middle distance, I want to move there and okay. look look her in the eye. What are you not telling us? I... Nothing. What, Abiku, what are you... What are you trying to imply? Since we came down here, you have been distracted. In the same way that Vasca never gets worried, you never get distracted. And I am asking you as your friend to please be forthright about how you feel, because we cannot do this if we are not united. And Dr. Aluso, for one, like, their eyes actually focus when you say that. Like, they draw back to you and they, they blink and it's like they're looking at you properly. And their eyes flick over to Oka, actually. Well, I've only really told Oka this, but I, uh, I don't exactly know who I am. I, similar to you, Abiku, I have some form of amnesia, I think. I don't, I don't remember a childhood. I just remember, well, living at my homestead and doing things, you know, helping people for a certain period of time. Working on the machine, I, um, my mind is, I can recall specifics. If I pick up an object, I can immediately tell, oh, this is from a certain time period. It accomplishes a certain purpose, but I couldn't tell you how I know that. I, uh... I've struggled with this since, well, since the cataclysm, really. And I, uh... I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't share this with all of you. I, I, it didn't seem... I don't know why I didn't share it. It's felt like, I don't know, it felt important not to share. Shameful, maybe. Um, it just felt like a secret. And Abiku, I know we've been friends, I would like to think, and Vasca for a while now, and you too, Costas, and I'm sorry I, I hid this from you, but it wasn't out of any sort of malicious intent. I can assure you that. There is something else I haven't exactly been forthright about, though. Um, specifically in regards to the chasm. Not that I've been actively trying to keep it from you, I just haven't realized it was what was happening un until now, I think. Um, I've always said I've long since suspected there's something going on with the chasm that could be related to the cataclysm, or even before then, when I was charting those magical spikes that I showed you way back a year ago, Oka. But I've never come down here to investigate myself. And I don't know why. Something just stops me. Every time. And I go back up. Everything in my bones is screaming at me to get out of here as fast as I can. 
I don't blame you for not coming down here on your own. No, Oka, I... In the interest of honesty and transparency, so you all can trust me, there's something in me pulling me as well, but not away. It wants to go deeper. Voska listens very intently, and I think hears the earnestness and confusion in Dr. O's voice, and wants to help her. So she walks up to him, and says, My friend, will you let me examine you? Uh, um, okay. Uh, and she says, just so we can have some answers if what is pulling you is affecting the same thing as Oka and I. What do I need to do? Soul magic. You what gotta pull want? on the you gotta pull on the weave and try to like sort of Aurora Borealis Dr. Elusa's soul out of their chest. Okay. But as you raise your hands up to try to like Dr. Elusa's like offering themselves. They want to also know. They step forward, I think like a little nervously and you put your hand forward and you try to do it, and you can't. It just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't in the weave I can't, or like a Biku's whole situation I can't, or how? Like, what is the You try prospect? to use magic, and it doesn't flow. Huh? Uh, you see, like, Voska kind of stop for a second. What's wrong, what? Voska? Is there something wrong with my soul? No, I... No, it's not you. It's my... And we'll look at Abiku and attempt Bardic Inspiration. And just no go... Nothing. Nothing comes out. I think you see Voska, like, pull out her flute and play a little melody at you, Abiku. And you would know this, because that was something she has played for you before when we've tried to hurdle across uh, ice blocks in Morose, And it gave you great agility. And Oka, you'd recognize that too, because that's the same tune she played when helping you against with uh, Sen. And her eyes widen. I think Abiku looks at their body and realizes something happened. And tries to have sun like uh let loose like a like a little bit of like lightning. Nothing comes out of Sun's mouth. Oh, oh, um, does in, in anyone is anyone that has magic able to use magic? I think Oka pulls a handful of bone shards out of a pouch that's kind of at their waist, and they throw them into the air, and they just clatter onto the ground. Doctor Aluso throws their hand open and a plate of hard light shimmers into existence as they just sort of like test and they lift themselves off the forest floor. And then they drop themselves back down and then they throw their other hand up and they turn invisible. It like ripples down their body and they're gone. And then like the invisibility peels off. And then they like finally fling their hand out again for that directional orb and it floats up magically above their palm. I, I think... I'm going to try to uh, cast Gust of Wind since that's more of a natural body spell I have as a Triton, see if that works. And then Doesn't work. And I'm going to see if I can use, like, key and, like, have the hand of healing going to see if it's just magic or if it's, like, all extra things. So how are you... I think we're on the forest floor now at, like, the base of the canopy, right? Uh, and as you fling out, as you do like martial forms, you can still like punch because you're still just like a fast, punchy person. But as you try to like make your hand glow with hand of healing, nothing happens. No, no, no. And Bud turns to you and goes, woof. No. <laughs> woof, woof, woof. Woof. <laughs> woof. Bud, I... Uh, don't, don't freak out. 
um, you are just, you're just barking right now. Um, woof, woof, woof. And Bud no, that, is like barking and starting to get anxious as he realizes he can't speak anymore and is starting to like jump from like paw to paw. And a Biku, as Sun like folds their wings in, they're like sitting on the forest floor. They turn to you and you hear Sun's voice in your head go, A Biku? Uh, I think I'm. And then poof! Sun like disappears. Sun? What what is it? What magic? Sun. Sun. Abiku. I don't think Sun is here anymore. Oh. No 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 no. Sun. Nothing. And Abiku sits down and starts sobbing hard uh absolutely like not responsive and just keep saying son i i think i'm gonna roll animal handling to try to calm bud down and give him like an anxiety treat that i keep sounds good uh make that roll i i think oka actually moves over toward Abiku and they don't really know what to do and I think there's this like low grinding sound kind of like a clock whose gears are stuck as the halo behind their head prism is what it's called uh their paragon weapon like starts to almost like grind and get stuck in its own motion um but they put like one hand on your back Abiku as they're kind of like also frantically looking up and around uh it's okay, it's okay. We're just, we're not exactly where we should be anymore. It's gonna be, it's gonna... What if, what if he's go, a gun? I I can't fail him. I can't fail her. I can't. And it's just like, not the, I think at some point slips into bar. <laughs> Oka, roll me a d20. Why, 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 why? 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 11. <laughs> uh, add your history modifier. Uh, that's a plus 11. 22? 22. Oka, as you place your hand on a biku, you look down, and as the gears continue to grind behind your head, you see... Tell me auburn or white fur flittering over the back of your palm? Auburn? Auburn. Uh, this kind of like dark red brownish fur starts to sprout, I think from the back of your hand as this entire time sends pacing inside you that rabidity has grown to a fever pitch. It's like a low, like almost like a tea kettle slowly getting louder in the background of the scene this entire time. But now it's so loud you can't ignore it anymore, Oka. Not in your own head. And all of you watch as Oka's left hand sprouts into this like red fur, and then it ripples up Oka's left arm, and then their right arm, and Oka shrinks and turns into a fox. As Oka lifts their head up, these two antlers poke up. They just shoot right up, like sprouts growing from the earth atop the forehead of their fox-like face. The cranking gears are gone. It's like they've melded into Oka's body. Like the robes, the wings all fold into the body, and it's just a fox with antlers, and that's Oka. Ah! I got for animal handling. Does that help with Oka as well? <laughs> the 13 with the treat is enough to calm Bud down momentarily. Like, Bud did calm down and then ate the treat, but as soon as Oka turned into a fox, Bud turned. No. No. Bud. Bud. No, no, no. No, we only chop bad guys. Ah! Oka's not a bad guy. 
Nope. And you see nope. Bud's like hackles begin to raise as Bud starts to get down. Like some sort of like, it's almost like whatever spell Root had used to awaken sentience in Bud is wearing off and he's reverting to a primal direwolf. Oh no. Costas turns to Vasca as this shit starts going down and goes, Vasca, wait, make me Nabuza's keeper right now. Maybe I can, maybe that'll fix everything. I think Vasca's panicking because this is the first time she has ever been stripped of everything that makes her her and makes her good and skilled and capable. And she is staring at her hands and her flute and is like so desperate and as Cossus is, is saying this like she's muttering under her breath like no, 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 not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. As you murmur to yourself, no sound comes out of your mouth. What the fuck? <laughs> your connection to Nebuza as a bard is, as a dancer, as a musician, you use breath and sound and music and song to make your magic work, and that connection is gone. That final thread, as soon as you try to speak and nothing comes out, bing, that sort of connects you to Nibiza, similar to the rabidity growing in Oka, snaps. I think how this manifests, if you would allow me, is that she's like muttering and it doesn't compute for her at first because you know, she's muttering under her breath. She hears this voice in her head that she's clearly muttering this and then Costas is being extremely insistent on this and she turns around and tries to yell out, I can't! What? What, 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 what? What's wrong? Vasca? And that's when Bud lets out a uh, feral <laughs> and charges after Oka. I pick up the Oka Fox. <laughs> I'm just gonna full on pick up the Oka Fox and take out a short sword and like start backing away from this wolf. Stay away. <laughs> I'm trying to like just be dominant, like back off. While that's happening, we swivel back to gentle. Uh, I, I think I'm going to try my animal handling again. Uh, I don't, I can't even do stunning strike, maybe. Like, uh, <laughs> I've been nerfed. Gentle, you approach on the other side, like behind Bud, as Bud's like advancing on a Biku and Oka. And Vasca, you and Costas are in one corner, like staring at her, like, what's happening? And as all this chaos descends in the middle of it, we just find Dr. Aluso, who's standing there, like head cocked to one side, looking at this <laughs> implosion of the party dynamic. And then their eyes, like, linger on Oka last. Like they're like drawn toward Oka like the most, but then their eyes are like pulled back to that directional orb. And without even saying anything to your group, they turn around and they walk. And we are gonna end the session there. Uh, so everyone, thank you so much for tuning into Arc 7, Episode 2 of Transplater RPG, the Chasm Session 1. I am your lovely GM and creator producer Connie, my friend Mr. Nagy and she. <laughs> Find me all across the internet at by Connie Chong. I'm gonna pass along after that just up and over to Dare. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Dare. Uh, pronoun she they fey. I played Gentle, who was a monk in like question marks and italics. Uh, uh that pronouns they them. You can find me uh being a hot mess in the disaster, writing games, playing in shows over on the interwebs at Dare to Dream RPG. D A R E the number two D R E A M R P G. I'm a writer, editor, performer. I do a lot, you know, just hire me. I'm great. Uh, I'm going to throw it down to Valiant Dorian. I'm suffering. <laughs> Hi, I'm Valiant Dorian. I don't have funny quips after that. 
um, Connie Tubosco's voice and my funny name quips. I see him his pronouns. I'm a Twitch variety streamer and a TTRPG performer. And today I have the distinct pleasure of playing Vosca, the Paragon Yabusa, maybe, who uses she they pronouns and has, oh god, it's hard when you rip the expertise out of the bard. That hurts. Uh, you can find me all around the internet at Valiant Dorian or at Also Spirit Bread. Please enjoy that lovely treasure hunt I just sent you out on. I do cool stuff. Come and check me out. And I'm going to pass our introductions over to Austin. Hey, everybody. I'm Austin. My pronouns are he, they, she. I just got to playing a Biku. Sit down and cry, Ishtar, uh, whose pronouns are she, they. Um, I am a game performer, designer, writer, and friend. You can find me on Twitter at Tales Can Austin. That's at Sailor SCT Austin. And that's all from me. Take it, see? <laughs> Hi everyone, my name's C. I use they them pronouns. You can find me making very trans, very gay art on the internet. Connie really wanted us to level up to Fort 17 for this episode only to take literally all of our power away. Uh, today I played a fox. Just a Kretcher. Today I played just a Kretcher. Okay, that's it. Uh, Connie, please make this end. <laughs> We love you all so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. What a wild ride. We're going to have three sessions left of the Chasm group. And I, I'm going to throw everything I got out of listening. We're approaching endgame. No holds barred. Uh, right now, we are going to be rating someone really awesome. Use the rating message in chat. Toss them a follow if you like their stuff, no doubt. Uh, tune in next Saturday, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on Transplanter RPG for the URL session, too, because they also had a wild start to their arc. You know it. Uh, we love you all so much. We'll see you on the flippity flip. Uh, follow us all over the internet, Transplanter RPG, and Bijou, Bijou.